There we go. Thank you, Ernie. You are consistently here. Hmm. Well, let's start with Nelson Mandela. Why not? Okay. <laughs> That's a good one to start. Yeah. <clears throat> I am. There you go. Okay. <laughs> oh, thank you. That's very kind of you. <clears throat> I just want to, it's on, but I'm telling you we're starting. Oh, yeah, right. Okay. Hello, everyone. Happy last afternoon keynote speaker. Isn't this exciting? That's what I thought. We still have seats up front, so feel free to come forward. Thank you, Linda. Um, I am delighted to be able to introduce um, Jolene Smith, who is the CEO for First Five. I'm actually a commissioner on First Five. It's very exciting. And poor Dr. Sparrow sat next to me at a conference in San Diego about six months ago, and here he is. So we are very delighted to have him here, and I'm going to let Jolene Smith go ahead and introduce him. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'll try to turn it by good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm going to turn it by good afternoon. You want to use that, this one? Okay. Can you hear me better now? Great. Good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today with all of you. Sincerely, we're co-sponsoring this incredible conference, and I'm really proud to be a co-sponsor with the County Office of Education and others because I think the work that you do every single day is so vital to our community. And how grateful I am personally for the great work that all of you do. And it leads to this honor that I have today to get to introduce my friend, Dr. Joshua Sparrow. I did corner him at lunch because, you know, he's a psychiatrist and I need a lot of help. <laughs> and every time I see him, I, Kathy was with us, every time I see him, I'm saying, Kathy, I'm sorry, but I need to dump on him about the... <laughs> free of charge, of course. <laughs> Unless I'm getting my bill someday. <laughs> um, so today it's my honor and pleasure. I'm going to stand here because I don't want to mess up his computer and what you're going to see in his incredible slideshow. but. Like I said before, my name is Jolene Smith, and I'm the CEO of First Five Santa Clara County, a proud co-sponsor of this incredible conference. And I really want to continue to ensure that today we're setting forth how a milestone day for us. This conference actually is a milestone because I want to ensure that our work together continues, that we continue to integrate, that we can continue to include each other in how we're journeying towards ensuring every child's developmental needs are may, met and that they grow up strong and happy and thriving. So it's a beginning, but it's also, it's also not just a beginning, but it's also a stretching of where we've been so far, but how can we go farther? Someone said to me one day, how do we go from good to great? Yeah. How do we go from good to great? So we're doing good, but we could be doing great together. So this is an important milestone for a journey that we're all on. I have the pleasure of introducing my friend, the director of the Brazelton Touchpoint Center at Boston's Children's Hospital and president of the Brazelton Touchpoint Foundation. And I feel obliged to read you about this man's background. I wish I could just say, I don't, he's a mentor for me. And then just let it be. Because I don't, yeah, I, yeah, in a past life, if there is such a thing, who knows, we'll find out someday. I'm sure, I'm sure we were brothers and sisters. He was, I was a lot younger, but we were brother and sister. <laughs> uh, 
the, vi the vision of the Brazelton Touchpoint Center is that all children, here capital A, capital L, capital L, grow up to be adults who can cope with adversity, strengthen their communities, constructively participate in civic life, steward our planet's resources, and experience the joy of nurturing the next generation to be prepared to do the same. That's pretty profound. And it's almost each one of our own responsibilities personally as well as professionally. So we're really attuned to your vision. The center partners with families of young children and the communities and systems of care that surround them so that all children, whatever their life circumstances, challenges, and resources may be, they will end up being healthy, succeed as early learners, and have the opportunity to thrive. Dr. Sparrow's work at Touchpoint Center has focused on cultural adaptations of family support programs, cross-sector collaboration, very important, and aligning systems of care with community strengths and community priorities. Again, alignment and attunement with the work that we do every day. I've had the honor of personally working with Dr. Sparrow, by the way, since 2008. I have had the, and I say that again, I've had the honor to work with Dr. Sparrow and also Dr. Brazelton. In 2008, they came to Santa Clara County. And it was an interesting story because I met Joshua first at a conference and we bonded because remember, brother and sister. And then I said, come to Santa Clara County, bring touch points. Bring touch points to Santa Clara County. Why? Because if we're launching our journey together and working together, it's all relational based. It's all connection and relationship and support and understanding how together we're in, we're in this journey. We're on this journey, but we're in this day, this very moment together. And how do we provide for the richness of who we're serving, but also the richness of each other? So I'm proud to say that since 2008, when we, de when we declared Santa Clara County in partnership with every county department, when we declared Santa Clara County, one of the first in the nation, I think, Dr. Sparrow, a touch point county, meaning that we were committed to pulling our resources together and working in a collaborative approach to ensuring that every system, everyone in this county experienced the touch point training experience. And today, to this date, we have trained over 4,700 people in this community in different systems. 260 different organizations have sent people to be trained. We have national, uh, in Boston, where the center is, we have sent 40 people. We have 40 certified trainers in touch points that are every single day working in this county inside systems sharing the touch points principles their vision, what, what I just read to you, inside those systems every day. And Joshua is going to talk to you in a minute about why it's so important to be a touch point county and why relationships matter. And you all know that. So Dr. Sparrow is, is using his organization to problem solve. He's really helped the first five. Not only in our inside organizations, but problem solve inside communities and problem solve nationally and internationally, on how we get past our barriers, ourselves, in our service to children and families. He's a co-principal investigator for the National Center on Parent, Family, and Community Engagement, and is a part-time associate professor in psychiatric at Harvard Medical School and my private psychiatrist. In 2010, he was appointed to the Health and Human Services Secretary's Head Start Research an evaluation committee, which we're all familiar with that, and currently serves on the American Pediatric Association's Child Poverty Task Force. And on the and really interestingly, and I saw evidence of this myself when I visited, um, on the American Indian Alaskan Native Head Start Collaborative. And he's on the advisory council, making huge inroads and impact on that underserved population. Dr. Sparrow's vast knowledge in children's healthy development and strengthening for relationships among families, parents, caregivers, 
providers and community is something that we can all learn from. It's something that we can all take back and not only apply to our work, our, but, our, but our communities, the neighborhoods where we live, and most importantly, ourselves. So it's an honor and it's a privilege to introduce my friend, my esteemed mentor, and my so psychiatrist, <laughs> Dr. Joshua Sparrow. I get to hug you. <laughs> I, I love you. <laughs> Me too. Well, thank you so much for that beautiful and almost entirely undeserved presentation, <laughs> except for the brother and sister yeah. part. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, we wouldn't be allowed to hug each other if that were true. <laughs> um, yeah, brother and sister. I, I had thought a while ago about, um, and probably others are, had already thought of it, that we could move from mentoring to co-mentoring. And that's part of what I thought wasn't quite true, as I have learned so much from you from the very beginning. And I always wish that we had more time together so that I could learn more, so we could learn together. And um, you always re-inspire me and get me going again. And I'm sure that that's what you do for everybody in the county. <laughs> and um, we all um, owe you such a huge debt for everything you've done to keep all of us going and to make the lives of children and families in this county so much better and to be a model for uh, the country. One of the things that you didn't mention was that from the project that we did together um, that started with a grant for uh, families where an infant had been born uh, after being exposed during pregnancy to methamphetamine, uh, one of the judges, Catherine, uh, Judge Catherine Lucero and I, who was on that project here, went to um, Capitol Hill and did a congressional briefing on, on that project. So uh, I feel like, in a way, what um, we might together say about the way that we work together and learn from each other is really the whole idea behind how, as professionals, we partner with families of children with special needs. And I, 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 I want to start by acknowledging that most of us who work with children with special needs also have children with special needs. And so we're all here, and it's not really possible and not really right to separate because um, we I don't think there's a professional hat and a personal hat where it's just all me it's just all you <laughs> um, so uh, let me start by introducing you to the touch points approach by introducing you to this four-year-old and by asking you what you think she's saying What do you think she's saying? What do you think she's saying? You out there, your homes, watching your smartphones and your tablets and your computers? <laughs> What's she saying? I can fly. I can fly. <laughs> what else? Hug me. Hug me. I'm, open to I'm open to anything. What else? I'm here. Yeah. So. Would you agree that she's speaking to us without any words? Often people say, I know what she's saying. She's saying, welcome, because I put bienvenido. <laughs> um, actually, I had to look at this slide for a very, very long time to remember what she really said, which was, mommy, could you roll the sleeves up, please? Your sweater's too big. <laughs> Every now and then, somebody guesses that. But my, my point is um, to say we speak powerfully to each other with our nonverbal behavior, whether we are typically developing or whatever the fair and right way of saying t developing differently might be. We speak powerfully with our nonverbal behavior. And as humans, we are set up to be extremely responsive. We're always scanning and searching for the nonverbal information that is coming from other human beings. Um, there are variations in the ways that we put out nonverbal behavior and how we receive and understand nonverbal behavior, depending on 
how we're developing. So you can clearly think about, for example, children with autism spectrum disorder, how this um, looks different for some of them. But we're really set up to be looking for this or experiencing it. And, and in the case of some of those children actually having to um, tune some of it out. Uh, but the reason why I asked you what you thought she was saying was because on the one hand, she's definitely talking to you, you're definitely listening, but you're not all making the same meaning of the nonverbal behavior. And so one of the keys to the touch points approach is to understand the power of nonverbal behavior, to understand the power of our need to make meaning of it, and how if we're going to actually understand each other, we need to stop at the observation, which would be she has her hands uplifted, fingers spread out, face kind of scrunched up. That's my effort to describe the behavior without saying what I think it means. Stop there, then notice this is what I think it means. Stop again and say, let me find out what the person I'm with is actually trying to tell me or what the parent who is with the child thinks it means before I put forward my inference, my interpretation, the meaning I make. And so much of where things get off track in our personal lives, I'll speak for myself, <laughs> in our work with our colleagues is because we don't get this. Then if you add in digital technology, <laughs> um, text messages don't give you any of this kind of information. Email doesn't give you any. How many times have you gotten an email where you thought, oh God, I just should kid myself now because um, I'm in such big trouble. And then you go talk to the person and they're perfectly civil and warm and it's like, oh, I totally misinterpreted that because you didn't have the nonverbal behavior to tell you what's going on. And to understand that for children who have differences in how they're developing, they may have special gifts here. This may be an area that is you know, either more fully developed earlier and, and more intact as perhaps a way of filling in for some things that are harder for them or it may be a struggle for them in different ways. But the heart of the approach is this attentiveness to how we communicate with each other in ways that don't involve words. And here is the vision statement as a way of introducing myself that um, Jolene read to you, for you to see, for you who are visual learners. <laughs> and um, what I'd like to add to what Jolene said is first to say, this word here, experience the joys of nurturing the next generation to do the same, wasn't in an earlier version of this. It was, and to be prepared to nurture the next generation, but not the joy. So how many of you know who Andrew Solomon is? Yeah, Andrew Solomon is um, this brilliant psychologist author. He has written a lot about depression and has been very open about his own struggle with it. And he wrote this um, wonderful book called Far From the Tree. And recently it just came out in a documentary, which I'm hoping you can find um, to look at. Uh, the book is 700 pages long, which is why you might want to look at the documentary. Um, so um, if you do want to read the book and you can't find the time for 700 pages, my suggestion is read the first chapter, anyone you want in the middle, and the last chapter. In the middle, the chapters are about what I think someone might call extreme parenting. So parents of children with all kinds of gifts and challenges. So, and he doesn't mean to conflate them or say that they're different. He just went and listened to lots and lots of families. So there is a chapter on um, parents of children with autism spectrum disorder. There is a chapter on parents of children with dwarfism. There is a chapter on um, parents of children who are transgender. There's a chapter on um, parents of children who become criminals. There is a chapter on um, parents of children who are the product of rape and, and much more. So take your pick. Um, the first chapter is called Son. And in it, to paraphrase, he says, I had two problems, and one of them my mother could fix, and the other she couldn't fix. I had dyslexia. That was my special need. 
And she really worked at it and she fixed that because look, I wrote 700, <laughs> I write these books that are 700 pages long. I think she got, took care of that. And the other is that I'm gay. And she couldn't fix that. And that was his mother's great sorrow. And her biggest concern for her child was that he would never experience the joy of becoming a father, becoming a parent. Guess what the last chapter is called? Close. <laughs> it's called grandson, you said. It's called father. And um, because the world is where it is, he's a father. Um, and I've actually met his son, George, who he talks about in the book. And, and the whole book in the documentary is really about the miraculous joy of parenthood, and in particular, the transformation of one's own being in the process of becoming a parent. But more than that, how being the parent of a child with special needs, and he doesn't at all minimize all of the stress and all of the challenges and all of the hardships, it's all in there. He honors it entirely. But what he found in his hundreds of interviews he did with parents is this kind of human nobility that that experience brought them. And this discovery of who they could be and what their child allowed them to become that was far beyond what they had ever aspired to. And that they discovered um, an experience of love, of love, that um, may not um, be accessible to those of us who may not have that experience. So when I read Andrew, our vision statement, and I said, what do you think? And he said, Josh, where's the joy? <laughs> you had to put the joy in there. I said, OK, Andrew, you're right. We got to put the joy in there. So that's the word joy. <laughs> the, other, um, the other reason I wanted to put this in front of you was because this is a very ambitious, it's a very ambitious vision. We're not going to do it by ourselves. And that's, I think, part of what Jolene was saying. It's going to be because we connect to each other and with others so that we can do this together. And really, the future of the planet and of the human species is at stake. No pressure or anything, but. <laughs> so the work of our center is to restore the position of babies and children as the first. And I mean first. And I'll tell you why. Priority of communities and societies everywhere. In, initial, in a nutshell, um, <laughs> First, because if you put babies and children at the center, it guides the decisions that we make collectively as a society, as a community, as an institution, you know, whether it's local or, or state or national. It, it guides the decisions that we make. Once, um, a long time ago, the city of New York consulted Barry Brazelton, who um, left us, sort of, on March 13th of this year, two months shy of his 100th birthday. Once the New York City, uh, I'm going to start crying, but I won't. Um, uh, once, our, once New York City consulted him to say, where should we site the nuclear power plant in our city? <laughs> and he said, well, you sure as heck ought to make sure that your evacuation path um, does not uh, put the child care centers between the, where the parents work and the nuclear power plant, because you can tell the parents to just evacuate. They're going to go to the child care centers and pick up their kids first. So in a literal concrete sense, putting babies and children first will guide all the decisions that we make about policy, funding, infrastructure, and so much more. And, and that is because humans were meant to orient themselves to their offspring's survival and thriving. And why restore? Well, in families and neighborhoods and communities, we are close into babies and children. And we get information from them. 
regardless of the ways in which they're developing, of the differences in their development, about what we got to do, what they need, and what's going on with them. Because we're right there, especially if we put our smartphones down. We get that information. But further away, whether you're in government or in philanthropy or in the corporate world, you don't have the same kind of really good data about what babies and children need. So instead, we have a commercial culture or a corporate culture whose imperative is not the reproduction of the species, the protection of our babies so that they go and thrive to reproduce. That's not their imperative. Their imperative is their quarterly profits. That's what it is. And that may be in sync with the well-being of babies and children, but only coincidentally, not by design. So that's why restore. And you can all think of all kinds of ways in which um, our world is working against the well-being of all of our babies and children, um, developing in all kinds of different ways because of these um, forces. So. I talked about stresses on families in the workshop that I gave this morning, and I'll just say that um, you're familiar with these. They've been around for a while. They're not any better. Barry Browston collected these over his decades, um, and there are more. Um, and I'll, I'll just point to the, um, the erosion of family traditions, neighborhoods, and community connections, because that's kind of what I just said about, in general, cultures transmit the best practices for raising babies and children with all kinds of differences in local contexts. And not to romanticize or idealize culture sometimes um, doesn't go so well. But that, in general, is a function of culture. And um, just to mention here that there are many cultural traditions that influence how we think about children with special needs. Uh, one time. I was talking with a colleague of mine at a Northwestern Plains tribal reservation, and she said to me, Josh, you know, you got it all wrong. For us, it's not about special needs. For us, these children are a gift from the Creator, and we were chosen. We were chosen and honored with this gift. It's a really different way of thinking about it than the um, mainstream culture. So these are other challenges to the vision that I put in front of you. And they're the challenges of today. And I've already mentioned um, digital technology as one of the challenges which makes it harder for us to tune into our colleagues, the parents we work with, the children we work with, developing typically or in many different ways um, makes it harder. But I, I am, I'm going to stop bringing you down to tell you that um, we actually know how to bring about the changes we strive for. And I will show you a videotape to illustrate. Sorry. Just human in mind. silent pain that will distress the baby. It seems part of our very nature to suffer at the suffering of others. We know that young babies, uh, as they become capable of moving voluntarily, will share. They will share food, for instance, with their siblings and with kids that they're around. They will soothe if they see somebody else in pain. Even the youngest of, of, of toddlers will try to reach out and pat the person, maybe hand over a toy. There's some lovely studies finding that uh, slightly older children are able to help others. When they see somebody who's, who's unable to fulfill a goal, they'll seek out to come to their aid. So one elegant demonstration of this comes from a recent set of experiments where they take a toddler, put him or her in a situation where an adult is in some sort of mild distress, and see if the toddler will voluntarily help, even without any prompting. And they find that toddlers typically do. There seems to be some sort of impulse in us that's altruistic, that's kind, that's compassionate.
So I don't know if um, all of you out in television land could hear the, the moans and the sighs and the awes in the room. I hope you were doing that while you were looking at your mobile phones too. <laughs> um, so I show this to you partly because um, humans really are set up to be able to be sensitive and responsive to each other and to care and to feel and to give and to share. That is how we're set up. And there's lots of evidence um, behind this. The question is, well, one question is, what happens? <laughs> Where does that go? Uh, the other reason why I wanted to show it today in the context of families who learn to cope with children with special needs is that often this is one of the areas of function that is there to celebrate. And one of the transformations I think we need to make in a more inclusive world is to really look at our hierarchy of values. Why is it that you don't even get a grade for kindness or generosity or sharing or the capacity to care? Why is it that we don't value that at least as much as the things that you do get a grade on? And I think part of leveling the playing field and getting to greater inclusivity would be looking at this hierarchy of values to include things that are currently not valued or less valued that are actually critical to human survival. That many children with special needs you know, are our leaders on who can show us the way on before we get there ourselves. And I'm not saying every child with special needs, but I will say uh, many. And um, uh, it is one place um, among many where parents of children with special needs can celebrate and those of us who partner with them can as well. So I wanted to talk now moving from our larger stressors to um, those on families with special needs. And I, I want to start by saying um, anytime we talk about a group, and you're familiar more, I mean, we're all more familiar with thinking about a group that's you know, referred to as a race or a group that's referred to as an ethnicity or a religious group, um, we are um, not paying attention to the fact that in that group, every single individual is just who they are, right? And maybe there are some common experiences like the experience of oppression and discrimination and inequitable access to resources, but we're all unique individuals. And so when I talk about families with a child with special needs, I want to be really clear that um, I, um, most of what I'm going to say is going to be wrong <laughs> and is not going to apply because it's a generalization. And I think general, generalizations are um, at the heart of racism, actually, because it's, it, it creates the delusion that we actually know when we don't. And that's the other reason why I showed you my daughter. <laughs> <laughs> in case you didn't guess, raising her hands up when she was four, was because there's work to do to understand who you really are. And the appearance of what you do or what I see um, doesn't necessarily tell us what your meaning is or what your intent is. So all of this may or may not apply to individuals, so I offer you that with that humility. There is this notion of the challenge of ambiguous loss. I bet everybody out there on TV land and everybody in this room can think about an ambiguous loss that they've had to deal with. Either the illness they've had that they did not know whether or not they would recover from or what permanent consequences it would leave them with or that of a relative. Uh, for example, uh, dementia how fast, how bad, a stroke, full recover, recovery, no recovery, uh, schizophrenia. Uh, many people with schizophrenia actually get better, but you don't know until you're there. So when you're in those moments of not knowing where you're going to get, you are struggling with ambiguous loss. And this is, um, I think, a fairly obvious major challenge. And it leads to, um, I think, uh, an understandable kind of uh, tension between one set of feelings and another or several others. That can be draining and exhausting and confusing. And the uncertainty 
when what it is that's going to hard or might not be hard or might not be there, uh, when um, managing that uncertainty is hard day to day, what's today going to be like? Um, if I have a child with an autism spectrum disorder, for example, there are some very good days where things go really well <laughs> and where, in fact, there are new um, developmental acquisitions that are right there and it's reassuring and wonderful. And then there are days where everything falls apart and I don't know if we're going to survive. Maybe we go to the emergency room and everything in between. And we don't know going to bed tonight what kind of day we're going to have tomorrow. Um, and we don't even know until we get to the end of this day how that day was going to be. Um, and then there's uncertainty about yourself as a parent, about other family members, about others who support you. How am I going to get through this? Am I going to get really depressed and check out? Um, is this going to trigger my own trauma, other traumas? Um, am I going to give up? Am I going to lose it? Am I going to smack my kid? And who can I count on? And are they going to be there? Um, and the future, of course. The future. Um, so a long time ago, I think of the children and families I've worked with as my most important teachers, um, along with Jolene. And it's the same kind of co-mentoring relationship. Um, a, the mother of um, a child with autism spectrum disorder uh, told me after the first year of working together, he was four. I still work with him. He's 32. So I've had this incredible privilege of, like, of watching what happens or being with what happens. She said, the hardest thing I've realized, the hardest thing about being his mother is balancing facing reality with maintaining hope. And I, I do think that that's at the heart of the challenge of ambiguous loss. You have to do both. Some days you can't do either. Some days you can only do one. And it's really like this roller coaster because you shift from one to the other sometimes because of the thing that happened in this moment. So this is the really hard part, and I think this is a part of our job. Stresses on families especially. It's fathers. Again, I don't want to make generalizations because um, they're, they're always wrong about a bunch of people. Um, so take this with like a great big fat grain of salt. Um, but in our mainstream culture, in most heterosexual nuclear families, Still, despite the changes that our society's been through, guess what? It's the mother who is the closest in at birth and in the first months or years, um, who shoulders a lot of the responsibilities in a lot of families, not all. Not all, but a lot. And when a child is born or early on has a special need, there is a whole lot of learning that parents have to do really, really fast about who is this child? What does this child need? What do we have to do? Where can we stimulate and challenge this child to grow and develop? Where do we need to protect and hold back? And it's all individualized, and it's hard to figure out. And we're talking about pre-verbal before the child can tell you, except through her behavior. Really hard to do. So if fathers, to some extent, in some families, are already feeling like, I really am not like in it in the same way, don't have the same kind of access or the same kind of respect. And now there is this greater set of challenges that make this even more mystifying, maybe. Then I'm even further out of it. And so I will just say in my own clinical work, I've seen a lot of marriages break up. And, and I think it's partly because um, we haven't recognized early on, we have to figure out how to support the fathers to come in to find their own role and to discover their own expertise. Um, there also are challenges for both parents, but when you don't get to be a part of making things better, it's harder for fathers. And I think for, for both parents, and again, generalizations are always wrong, so I'm not talking about everybody. Um, but you all know the now famous saying about, when I was having this baby, I thought we were going to Paris, but it turned out that we were going to Amsterdam instead. Right? You all have heard that. So um, in the process of accepting, yeah, Amsterdam's going to be pretty interesting, too, and very rewarding and a good place to be, getting there 
means getting over a whole bunch of other feelings. Like, is it my fault? Did I do something wrong? Does this reflect on me? Is there something I didn't do or something I shouldn't have done? You know, the guilt, the self-blame, and so many other feelings. Well, if you're further out and unsupported to be able to step in and feel competent and masterful, where you actually do all of that really hard learning and you feel like, this child really needs me. I can really help this child. I understand this child. It is really hard and really exhausting, but I get who this child is. And I love this way, this child in this deep and profound way, like Andrew Solomon talks about this, like it's, it's a gift in its own way, despite how hard it is. The father who's often further out gets the, I don't know how to do this and I blame myself, but doesn't get the reward of a, oh, this child really needs me and I'm getting pretty good at understanding how to do this. And I think that's also part of why marriages break up. And that then makes it so much harder for everybody. I think it's preventable. But I think in our typical systems of care, we focus on the child. We focus on the child. And we don't focus on the parents. And we don't focus on the marital relationship as much as we could. It's hard to get permission to focus on the marital relationship. And if we have time today, we'll talk about some strategies for building trusting, safe relationships where you can get closer to that permission. Um, then siblings. I've treated so many siblings of children with significant special needs. Um, I know of siblings who have committed suicide. Like, you know, beautiful, healthy, promising siblings. Um, but who have felt um, so many things that are hard to feel that some of them have told me about. Like, I was supposed to fix everything. I was, I was seven years old. I was supposed to make everything better. I was supposed to stop my sister from hitting my mom or from, you know, throwing the dog down the stairs. I was supposed to make it all better, and I failed, and I'm no good. Uh, or... Um, I felt humiliated and embarrassed because I knew how the other kids would think about my sibling. And then I felt really guilty about being embarrassed. And then I couldn't like, really be in my family the way I wanted to be. Or like I wasn't supposed to need my family, my parents' attention. They were using up everything they had, and they, that's what they were supposed to do. And I was supposed to figure out how to not need any. And, and those feelings of like, I need something too, I feel really guilty about. So a whole bunch of really hard stuff, really hard stuff for siblings that I know many of us are paying more and more attention to and there's a whole um, organization that runs sibling workshops and teaches people how to do them around the country. But I, I think it needs to become the standard of practice that whenever there's a sibling, we, um, we welcome them into the, the circle of care. Um, relatives, professionals, and institutions. We're, we're all in these family systems if we're really doing our work. And there are um, costs for all of us that I will come back to when I talk about gatekeeping. Work and finances. Sometimes in our, in our therapeutic roles that we define, we feel like we can't go here, we can't go there. But often, these things are really weighing on, on parents. You all know this. and so. One of the guiding principles of the touch points approach is to go beyond your traditional role. And that doesn't mean hug your patient if you're a psychiatrist, although personally I think if it's not erotic or romantic or sexual, sometimes a hug is pretty um, powerful therapy. Uh, <laughs> I probably shouldn't have said that, but I just did. Um, <laughs> um, and, um, um, but the same thing about getting permission to look at the things that are really weighing on people. And you all know that parents of children with special needs have a much higher rate of depression, much higher rate of depression. And depression is triggered and reinforced and sent over time because of a host of stressors that pile up. Um, and, and it's very hard to become, as a parent, the expert about your child with your child's particular gifts and talents and strengths and challenges and needs, at the same time to become an expert about the very difficult systems we have to support the care of the child 
and also to understand the various potential financial benefits that might be there. And the one other thing I'll say there is, I think a lot of parents you know, may, you know, are wondering, OK, I have an 8-year-old, or I have a 12-year-old, or I have a 3-year-old. But if this child survives, this child will be an adult who um, may not be able to support herself. What do I do about that? And sometimes there's just no um, attention left for that. And then it hits parents really hard you know, when the child's 14, 15, 16. And then that's really front and center. Um, so I think we can also make that a standard of practice, that it may not be our job, it may not be our area of expertise, but it should be in the comprehensive treatment plan that there is someone with that expertise who is working with. Um, and then there's social isolation. And in our work developing adaptations of touch points for families of children with special needs, we heard this over and over again, that there's just no time, there's just no place, and I can't go to places because my child won't tolerate being there, or because people won't tolerate my child being there, or because I'm uncomfortable. People don't make me feel comfortable with my child um, being there. And I have to put so much time and so much work that um, I have no time for friends. And I, you all know this, but I think the power of friendships, not Facebook friends, but like people who you can sit down with and just unload with, is um, increasingly undervalued and underrated, particularly when you are carrying a heavy load. And then finding time for pleasure. I, I see this over and over again in the parents that I work with. It's almost as if there isn't a sense of permission for self-care. Because if I have a second left of waking time with any energy at all, I need to devote it to my child. And this is the put your own oxygen mask on before you put it on your child challenge, right? But it's very hard, given the conquer realities, for parents to do this. But there's this emotional obstacle, which is a, I feel so guilty if I took any time for myself. And that may at least be the part that we can help with if we honor the concrete material obstacles as well. Uh, I think I mentioned a lot of these uh, to be just specific about there is a body of literature looking at parents' experiences of receiving the diagnosis, where uh, parents endorse clinical symptoms of, of trauma, post-traumatic stress disorder. So it's important to know when we're wondering why a parent might be reacting in a certain way to something we say or do, that we may be re-triggering them, that they are truly traumatized, and they, are, they may be having intrusive memories, and they may be experiencing us in a way that we hadn't imagined, but can understand if we walk into that interaction with this awareness that um, there are very good reasons why this parent may be struggling with post-traumatic stress disorder. The tyranny of developmental milestones, again, when we talked with parents of children with special needs for our adaptation, you know, touch points kind of lays out chronological times for the touch points, and they would say, that really does not work for us at all. You know, we are so sick and tired of people saying, this is when our child should do this or that, and that's not how it's going to be, and we know that. And we feel so excluded, like we don't even exist with this stuff. Um, so it, to understand what it's like to be in the world when that is what the world is saying back to you, instead of honoring, it will be at your child's pace. Uh, the last one that I want to talk about is um, attribution theory and explanatory models. <laughs> and that's this idea that Humans are meaning makers. Humans are storytellers. And um, I think, invariably, parents have made meaning of why their child is the way he or she is. They've, they've made meaning of it. They have a story about it. And if we're going to work with them, we need to create a safe and trusting relationship in which they can tell us what that story is. 
so that they can hear themselves tell a story and we know what that story is. I once worked with um, a child with ADHD when I was in training. And it was such a lesson. I mean, so many times the things you screw up in life are the things that teach you the most. Um, and um, at the end of the year, the, the mother said to me, do you think he's this way because I did cocaine during pregnancy? And I just thought, God, I wish I'd asked about that in like the first couple of weeks or something. Because she was carrying that all by herself. And everything that I said to her about what was going on with him and what we could do, I'm sure she was l listening to through the filter of a, I damaged my baby. And if we had, could have gotten that into the room between the two of us, it would have been a much stronger partnership. I don't think that that's the exception. Humans need to organize their experience into stories. That's what we do. And there is, um, in Fad Anne Fadiman wrote this book called The Spirit Catches Who You Fall Down um, about a Hmong family with um, a, a baby who had um, uh, refractory seizures, did not respond to any of the typical treatments. And uh, it turned out that she was not responding because they weren't giving her the treatments that the Western doctors were prescribing here in California. Because their story was, we moved from Laos to Merced, and our baby's soul was stolen by the Nibs, who are baby soul stealers. Because the protection against soul stealing is the placenta. It's a jacket that holds the soul in. And you're always supposed to bury that jacket underneath your house. And we did, but then we had to leave. And so she wasn't protected. So why would we give her pills? Like, what's that going to do? So uh, in her book, she quotes Arthur Kleiman, who has eight questions to ask to get to the story, which I would urge you to read. And there are questions like, what do you call this thing? Um, what do you think caused it? What's the worst thing about it? Um, what do you think needs to happen so it can get better? There are a couple of other questions, but that's the main idea, to have those questions early on so that you're there together. And we may have very different stories, but we can't really do the work if we can't work towards bringing our stories together. So um, the next thing I'd like to talk about is something that I also talked about this morning, because it'll get us to building safe and trusting relationships with parents, I hope. So uh, as professionals, inadvertently, we often disrupt we often disrupt parents' sense of their own expertise. And for parents of children with special needs, more than other parents, they so often know so much more than any expert does about their child. Because there's really a lot to learn and because they're super motivated to work really hard to understand who their child is. And so I think um, often our professional training, whether it's, I don't know what kind of school you went to, um, does not prepare us to really see parents as our teachers. And instead, I think we feel that our job is to teach them what we know. And we know a lot, and we worked hard to know what we know. But it can be hard for parents to be open to what we do know if it isn't more mutual. Because ultimately, they're going to want to know, well, can we integrate what I know with what you know? Are they compatible with each other? Uh, and also, I'm the one who's going to be taking care of this child for the rest of my life. You're not. And I have to be able to really internalize and absorb whatever expertise is needed um, to be able to care for my child. And I think part of this problem is that uh, in our formal academic training, we, we end up thinking that there's just one way of raising a child. And we leave out 
all of the variables that come from this child's individual personality or temperament. And of course, as you all know, it doesn't matter what kind of um, special challenge a child has, he or she is her own individual person with her own personality, her own temperament. And that will matter a lot. And parents know who that child is. It will matter a lot what the family structure is, what the context is, what their resources are uh, as to how you do this. So that what we get taught in our professional preparation really has to be totally reworked to include all of those things. And that requires a different kind of partnership with um, parents. Um, I talked this morning about the difference between technical and adaptive challenges, but this is really the heart of it. Raising a child, typically developing or developing differently, is an adaptive challenge. There isn't a cookbook recipe. There's not a protocol to do it. There's some good guidance, some good advice, some strong experience, some evidence-based this or that. But if it's going to work for any individual child or family, it's usually got to be reworked and adapted around who they are and where they are. Because it's not as simple as um, changing a fan belt in a car engine. I don't even know if cars have fan belts anymore. Um, it's just not, that's a technical problem. An adaptive problem is one where you've got um, members of a system, like members of a family or members in a school, kids, teachers, and uh, they're all going to do their thing and interact with each other, but you don't know where it's going to go. It's unpredictable. And so you have to have relationships in place in a family that include all of us, where we can work on this together, where we can learn from each other, where we can be open to what you have to teach me, um, where we don't get stuck on my daughter's doing this and I know what she's saying, but I need to ask her what she's saying. I need to ask her parent what she thinks she's saying. So the parent is the expert on their child. Oh, and actually here are the questions that really put um, parents in that position of expertise. Because when you ask questions like this, and you can adapt the sickness word to the special need, um, you're positioning yourself as a learner. You are positioning yourself as a learner from the parent's expertise. You are elevating their view. What do you call the problem? What caused it? What do you think it does? Um, how does this work? How severe is it? Will it last a long time? What will help? What are the main problems that are the result of it? What's your biggest fear? And I think it's always really important to get to what's your biggest fear. Because it's right there underneath the surface. I think people always bring that with them wherever they go. And it's really important to have it be something that you share together. So I, I now want to um, talk about why this can be hard for us in our professional roles. And it's something that uh, Ron Lally called protective urges. And Barry Brazelton called it gatekeeping. And what Brazelton said was that any two adults, you and me, you and you, who care passionately, you out there in television land who care passionately, they're, they're out in television land. They're all looking at me here like, what are you talking about? There's people watching us. Um, any two adults who care passionately about the same child are highly likely to enter into competitive conflict with each other. Have you tried to raise your own child with another adult? If so, have you always agreed on everything? No. Out in TV land, these people here, they're saying no. Right. What about if you've ever um, had to bring your, had, have conversations about your child with a teacher or a pediatrician or somebody doing uh, OT or PT or speech and language? Have you always agreed about everything? And as colleagues, say you're doing OT or say you're doing PT, have you always agreed about everything for this child? It's pretty endemic. And the most obvious one are um, parents and their mother-in-laws. 
right? <laughs> I wasn't looking at you. <laughs> um, so why does this happen that we have this sort of competitive conflict with each other? I think it has to do with attachment. And what this helps us understand about attachment is we don't just attach to the children we are biologically related to. We attach to other children, too. And that's why that's why I always tell parents who have adopted kids, don't worry about attachment. This is going to happen anyway. You can't help it. <laughs> you didn't have to give birth to them. Um, and uh, guess what other really important human process involves the same hormones in the same parts of the brain as attachment between individuals who are not biologically related. Love, yeah, love. Someone here knew it, someone here said love. It's the L word, love. The same hormones, the same parts of the brain are activated when two adults who are not related love as in attachment. So it's really clear that we get attached to other people's children. And the attachment process we experience even more intensely because there's a baby inside of each of us. And none of us, well, I would be very surprised if any of us got through babyhood and childhood. <laughs> without ever having suffered, without ever having needing comfort we didn't get, without ever having felt alone in ways we really couldn't handle, without ever having wished for some kind of someone with us that we didn't have, right? Um, so we bring the baby inside of us and those experiences, whether we know it or not, to the passion we bring to caring for our own children and to other people's children. And when a child is suffering badly, like this child who has what was called chronic hospitalism because he um, lost one relationship after another and eventually stopped eating. And it used to be called anaclytic depression. This is from a book by Rene Spitz from the 1940s. And, and, and uh, his immune system shut down. I mean, the, the loss of the capacity to be in the attachment process has profound physiological consequences. And he died. So when we see this baby, you don't know this baby, but I'm watching all of your faces. I can't see your faces on your um, phones. Um, but everybody's feeling it, right? We're all feeling for this baby who died you know, half a century ago or more who we don't know, as humans, just like the little 20-month-old who opened the closet for the guy who was caring too much, we're all feeling it. And here's another um, slightly older child from that same work on the loss, the repeated loss of attachments. And it looks, in this case, as if the light has gone out of the eyes of this little boy. And he's just not there to enter into an attachment relationship with anybody anymore. And as I look at your faces, I can't see your faces out in TV land, but I can look at the faces here in the room, and everybody's feeling pretty horrible. And this, I'm sorry, I meant to make one, but, but in your work, there will be days when you're feeling like, wow, this kid is really suffering, and I don't know if I can help make this kid feel better, and I know what's going to happen at the end of the day. This is, I think, the motor behind the conflicts that we get into with each other as professionals, and with parents when a child is suffering. Now, I think the way through this, the way through this is to recognize this is because in us we still do have what that little 20-month-old had. We see someone who needs help and we want to help. And if we look at the other adults, parents, colleagues, and how although we violently disagree with them about what to do, if we can see through that, through that to see, but they have they all have the same profound and noble human instinct to want to respond to a child's suffering, 
to care and to help. It really helps bring people back around the table if you can surface that and honor that and say, hey, we're all really good people. <laughs> we're all here because we all care deeply with our full personhood about helping children who are suffering. And then you have this idea, you have that idea about how to do it. Um, but it feels really differently, and we can sort through the differences and get to what, how we're going to deal with our differences if we can honor the spirit that we actually all share. And just to say that when working with families in which there's a child with a special need, this is not always, but often it's much more intense. And you can think about moments, for example, when a child has been looking like they've been making progress and doing better, and then suddenly there's a huge relapse. Has that ever happened to you? And then everybody feels like a failure. Like, what did we do wrong? What did we not get? And, and, and when the feeling of guilt and self-blame, like, I should have known this, I should have done that. I mean, have you not asked yourselves that? <laughs> um, when you can't stand feeling that way anymore, like questioning your own professional competence, what happens next? What happens next? Well, if only those damn parents hadn't done this and they'd done that. That's what happens. Because you can't handle it anymore. It's not because we're bad people. Um, so the shift there is from these really burdensome and painful emotions that are a part of how much we care to honoring how much we all care, how hard it is for all of us to fail, and then to come back together to get really curious and to be ready to face the challenge and discover, what is this teaching us? What is this teaching us? Uh, and you can't start learning about this child in this moment until you get past the really hard feelings of self-doubt and self-blame. Uh, and I think if we can look at them in ourselves, it makes it a lot easier to empathize with very similar feelings that parents are likely to have in those circumstances. So I think uh, I, I want to talk a little bit about our roles as leaders. Because I believe that everybody who does this work, everybody in this room, everybody on their phone or their tablet or their computer, we're all leaders. I think parents are leaders. And you know, parents of children with special needs have been models for the whole country, this country, and for all kinds of parents as advocates and as leaders. Whenever we look for what parent leadership is and how it works and how to do it, where we all look is that parents of children with special needs, they have really made the model and paved the way. So being a leader doesn't mean about being alone or being in a hierarchy. <laughs> I think of leadership as distributed leadership where we connect with each, with each other's power to be more powerful together. So it's particularly important, I think, to understand our roles as leaders when we understand that the challenges we're working on do not fit this model of linear causality. A does not cause B. Remember I talked about a technical problem might be when your fan belt breaks in your car, you get a new fan belt, and then you're on the road again. And an adaptive challenge might be, um, I'll take again a child with an autism spectrum disorder who um, had something that really scared them happen, but they can't tell you because they don't even know it scared them, but it did. And so then they are behaviorally dysregulated for six months, and then finally they can tell you, you know, um, um, somebody said something sarcastic to me. <laughs> and they'd completely fallen apart for six months. Uh, and they might not use the word sarcastic, but they would get the point across. Um, that's not a technical problem, right? That's a problem that we're all in supporting the child through the dysregulation. 
and helping the child learn the skills to identify what's the feeling I had, what is the thing that provoked the feeling, and what are the tools I have to get myself back under control. That's an adaptive challenge. And in a school setting uh, with other children and their parents and teachers and aides and specialists, it's a complex system where um, it's not A causes B. We're all working together. The, class, the physical environment of the classroom, again, to think about um, children with uh, sensory differences, the physical environment um, is part of the system in which children grow through their um, challenges. So for us to think about our work as being um, one of these points in a system, the child is in the system, the family's in the system, all of our colleagues are, all the other kids in the classroom are. We're in the system, we're all interacting with each other, and we're going to get as close to best we can if we have um, open, clear information and positive emotional energy flowing in the system among ourselves, which is why I just told you about gatekeeping, because that gets in the way of that. So I, I want to say just a little bit about um, all of us as systems leaders. And this comes from a paper that uh, John Kenya, Peter Senge, and Hal Hamilton wrote that is in the uh, Stanford Social Innovation Review. So there are three core capabilities of system leaders. And the first is to see the larger system. So you might be an occupational therapist or a physical therapist or a speech and language person, or you might, or you might be a teacher, you might be an aide, you might be a parent. Um, and you know where you stand. But it's to see who else is in the system, where they are, what obstacles they have, what opportunities they have, who they're connected to, how the flow of information and energy, emotional energy, is going across the system, to see the whole system. The second is to see the assumptions that we take for granted or to create a climate and processes where we can discover them together. And the assumptions can be so-and-so is not doing her job or so-and-so is you know, doing it the wrong way or the parents really should be doing it that way or this kid's never going to be able to do that, right? There's lots of assumptions because we are managing uncertainty. We're dealing with ambiguous loss. So to create processes and a climate where we can discover the assumptions that we're making together, that's our work. And again, that's why I talked about gatekeeping, because that gets in the way. And we can move that out of the way to discover what are the assumptions that um, interfere with our understanding, what the strengths and richnesses are that parents bring, that the child brings, that we all bring, that can help us get closer to making things a little better. And then the last is shifting from reactive problem solving. And you all know that, right? You've got, you've got a kid who um, keeps on aspirating, and you've got to keep on suctioning, right? Or a kid who keeps on having meltdowns, or um, a kid who keeps on losing motor function, um, or a kid who's got language development and then language loss. I mean, we got real crises to react to, and it's not that we don't react to them. Um, but it makes it really hard to picture where could we all go together? Um, what are we going to try to shoot for um, together? So this I see as um, a really important guide for all of us wherever we stand, um, wherever we stand in the system. Everything is connected to everything. And you've probably all seen this um, videotape before, but I want to. Um, show you a videotape of uh, an eight-week-old baby and his mother, because I think it gets at this idea of the connections in systems. Um, and many of you have seen this, but I think it's, it's, it's useful to watch it in this context. How is it, wherever we stand in the system, that we can contribute to the effective flow of information and positive energy to get the system to work well. 
together. So in this video, um, you will see an eight-week-old in a split screen with his mother. They're first instructed to interact as they typically would. And then the mother's asked to turn away, and when she turns back, to go stone-faced, inanimate, unresponsive. And it was designed to simulate parental depression. And we know there's a high risk of that when parents are, have a child with special needs. But um, I want you to think about, and I'll, I mean, I can speak for myself. I will think about the times when I have shut down and withdrawn because I didn't know how to handle what I was feeling because I wanted to bite someone's head off but knew that was probably not a good idea, but I didn't know what a more constructive thing <laughs> would be. And so um, shutting down and withdrawing, subtracting, pulling out information in positive energy from the system that we all work in. Um, so here it is. He's eight weeks old. There he is. There he is. What are you hitting? What are you hitting? What are you? What? What? Oh, what's that? What's that? Boom, boom, boom. Oh. Oh. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh. Oh. Oh, you're yelling. You're yelling. What are you doing? Hmm? Yes, yeah, Smiley. That's great. She's starting to look uh, troubled yeah, already because she knows it's time. See you. Okay. You come back with Watch how he reacts. Face, flat face. And just sit in front of him. And he's really distressed. Yeah, he's eight weeks old. And he's so happy when she comes back in again. And he's beginning to realize, oh, God, what's up? Takes him about... 11 seconds to realize she's not being who she's supposed to be. And then he will try 15 different ways of her back. And he's got such a big repertoire of things to try because it usually works. So he's been persistent and resourceful, and he's got the energy to put into it. Nice. He says, where yeah. the heck were you? Yeah, what's this? What's this, huh? And then he turns away as yeah. if to punish her, Dr. Brosnan used to say. And then his eyelids soften what's and they're back together again. So uh, this, this fundamental process, which is nonverbal, which is where we started with my daughter, this is happening all the time in our interactions. And there are these moments where we are um, struggling to protect ourselves. It's really about protecting ourselves in our own sense of professional competence or parental competence. So we withdraw, we shut down, we retreat because we're in protection mode when faced with a challenge that threatens our sense of professional identity or parental identity because it threatens our sense of competence. And so if we think about ourselves as system leaders, first of all, let's all give ourselves permission to feel that way, <laughs> right? But then hold ourselves responsible for moving through the protective mode to the learning mode, the curious mode, the discovery mode. So I'm going to stop with a story after which we'll have a couple of minutes for questions, uh, which we were told when we talked with lots of parents about their experiences of um, raising a child with special needs. And this was a father who, whose baby uh, had not been diagnosed during pregnancy and was born with Down syndrome. And um, I won't try to speak to the full range of emotions that a parent has, but there are a lot of really intense emotions that a parent has at the birth of their baby regardless, right? So this is on top of that. And um, he described how 
the pediatrician picked up his baby, held the baby in her arms, and looked into the baby's eyes, cooed at the baby, and responded to the baby's responses by smiling and softening. And the father said, it was as if the pediatrician said, go ahead, it's OK for you to fall in love with your baby. So I'll stop there. And I think we have um, time for some questions. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? All right, do we have questions from the chat room? Yeah, there's one back there. <laughs> you should have sat in front. <laughs> Hi, first, thank you so much for such a wonderful presentation. Um, I love that you talked about attachment, and I have wondered for a long time why it's not mandatory, a full semester, not just a blip in development for teaching courses and why it's not throughout all of our public education system, this understanding of the importance of relationships. Mm -hmm. um, so do you have an answer for how to make that more prevalent and kind of the foundation for our public education system, building relationships first? Well, that's a good question. Um, I think I have an answer to that. <laughs> Let's ask everybody in the room. <laughs> Anybody have an answer to that? I have uh, a microphone. <laughs> I, I, I've actually, I thought about that sort of thing for a while. And um, I, I don't know. Sometimes I feel like when we have a strong belief about something, we become our own worst enemy because it gets in the way of listening to people of other strong beliefs. And so we get more and more polarized. And so, um, I'll tell you where I think this comes from, aside from being a middle child. <laughs> where you're like the only one who actually, doesn't matter what you think, you just gotta figure out how to get people to think, get along. Um, is uh, Barry Brazelton and I wrote a syndicated column for the New York Times for many, many years together. He wrote it for many years before he asked me to help him with it. But I did it with him every blessed week for 12 years, 750 words, and it went all over the country. And we get lots of nasty mail. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of really nasty mail from people who really disagreed. And it really opened my eyes to the fact that, um, you know, there are a lot of people with very strong ideas and feelings um, and see the world in really different ways. And it made me really curious about understanding those different ways and really to want to try to be humble about my own ideas. So I think the first step in that is to actually find out, well, what are people passionate about? in the education sphere who aren't focusing on that? And um, what, what are the rationales behind what they believe? So I'll, I'll give you one example. Um, we worked in the Harlem Children's Zone for a long time. This is not exactly the same thing, but it's the same kind of process. And um, we did a parent night with parents of children in the pre-K program. And um, it was about the value of play in learning. And it's a similar sort of dilemma, I think, right? Where there, there are people who think, what do you mean, play? <laughs> so um, the parents in the room said to us, play, that's a luxury for you upper middle class white people. We can't afford to have our children play. We are in Harlem, and the public schools are terrible here. And the only chance that our kids have of surviving is getting the heck out of here into charter schools. And they got to pass tests, which means they got to learn how to read, they got to learn how to do numbers, they got to learn their shapes and colors. They don't have time to play, that's a luxury. So, you know, we, it was important to go and find out. And then um, we, um, we put all kinds of toys out, bristle blocks and Legos and little farm animals and stuff like that on the tables, on the children's tables with little seats, you know, that break your back if you're an adult. And, um, we had the parents like sit around the tables and say, you know, go for it. And I sat at the table where all the fathers grouped, for some reason all the men went together. And they were looking at me like, you people are out of your minds, like what are we supposed to be doing? <laughs> but pretty quickly, 
pretty quickly they started examining the stuff, trying it out, and making stuff together. And, uh, and then after a while, we told them to stop, but they didn't want to stop. <laughs> and then we said, well, so what did you do? And they told us what they did. We went to Africa, we made a zoo, we built a bridge, we made a fort, and we had a war. And then we said, and what did you learn? And they talked about we learned um, how to tell stories, we learned how to imagine, we learned how to share, we learned how to take turns, we learned how to do things together. I mean, they really discovered, you know, through the experience. So I would take those principles of like just being humble and curious about um, people who have positions that seem really different, and then um, not thinking that talking at people actually is going to be a part of the process of um, discovery. And, and I guess the one last thing I'll mention is um, attachment is, I, was, I actually was going to talk about this, and I thought, oh, well, I don't have time, but I will now since you asked the question. Um, attachment looks different in different cultures and different contexts. And there is a way in which there is a kind of dominant white upper middle class culture holds it out as a kind of um, requirement or expectation which leaves out a lot of people and can be oppressive. Um, so I have a number of stories about how attachment can look that you know, can be quite shocking, which I won't tell you, but I'll tell you one which is actually gentler and more amusing as a way <laughs> to respond. Um, this story that Barry Brazelton used to tell about how when he was on the, um, the island of Santorini doing research with newborns, because he looked at newborn babies around the world, uh, he had the privilege to um, observe a delivery. And his wife was actually in the delivery room too. I don't know what a delivery room would look like on the island of Santorini in Greece. And uh, the mother was um, going through her contractions, and she had at her side a collection of tin cans and sticks and stones. And every time she had a contraction, she'd pick one up and throw them, throw one at her husband, <laughs> who was in the corner. <laughs> and <laughs> have, you, have you heard him tell the story? And um, so he's with us. I said he kind of left us, but he's kind of still here. And um, um, and he would groan, and then she would groan, and then she'd have another contraction, and she'd pick up another one and throw it on, and he would cower, and you hit him, and he'd groan, and she would groan. And um, Dr. Brown's wife was really quite alarmed and said, really, really, like, can you, is this really okay? And um, they understood that this is just how you do things there. And it was, you know, the, the father's way of being in the experience <laughs> with her. And then um, when the baby was born after all this, uh, the, Dr. Brazelton took the baby and offered the baby to the mother, and the mother looked away, went like that. And so his immediate assumption was, oh God, this is going to be terrible. No attachments happening here. We're in big trouble. Right away. 30 minutes later, she said, give me my baby. I'm ready now. And I think, I mean, many of us have heard this story over and over again. That there's this kind of oppressive expectation that many women suffer with because they just they're feeling it in their own way. And it isn't always like in the attachment textbook. And if we make them feel like they um, did something wrong or they missed out on something, we're actually creating a problem where there didn't have to be any. So I would add that caveat to attachment as well. We have one minute. But I'll, I'll hang out if there are questions. <laughs> did you have a question? You were just scratching. Well, why don't we stop, out, stop here, and um, I will hang out if there are questions that anybody wants to ask that we didn't have time for. Thank you again. Thank you for all the work. Let's that all you're clap. Doing. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sparrow. Uh, we now have time for a break, and Dr. Sparrow will be here if you want to talk to him. Thank you. <laughs>